I mean, I merely expressed from the chair the hope that you reach a fairly speedy conclusion because my lawyer's instinct smells the familiar aroma of judicial review. Thank you very much, um, all three of you, for giving evidence. We'll now move on. I see that the familiar garrulousness of my noble friends in the House of Lords means that has not, we've not reached the end of Amendment 1 yet. Um, so we may get away with no more than one division during the course of this evidence session. Um, our next witness, and we welcome you warmly, is Sue Berelovitz, um, Deputy Children's Commissioner and Chief Executive of the Office of the Children's Commissioner. She leads um, on matters relating to youth justice policy for the OCC. Um, she's recently led an examination on an extremely important subject, which is certainly dear to my heart, an examination of the mental health needs of young people in custody and the quality and range of service provision across the secure estate. And she's a, she represents the OCC as a member of the National Advisory Council for Mental Health and Emotional Wellbeing of Children and the National Advisory Group for <coughs> Health and Criminal Justice. Welcome. Thank you. Would you like to give an introduction to what you wish to say? I would, thank you. And um, I'm most uh, grateful to have been invited here today and I'm delighted to be giving evidence at this session. I would like to start by saying that our statutory remit is to promote awareness of the views and interests of children. And so everything I say today will be driven by that, and indeed will be driven by what I have seen for myself when I visited children across the secure estate and spoken to children who have experience of the secure estate and from what I've heard personally from children. I would also say that uh, our strategy remit is due to change over the next few years. It's about to be strengthened, and we will have a statute duty to protect children's rights as well. And of course, we welcome that, and we do work in that spirit right now, so that too informs everything that I'm saying. So, as my preamble, I would like to bring children right into this room, please. And while I know that some of this, or indeed much of it, may be very familiar to people um, in the room, I think it's important to uh, put on the record the profile of the youngsters that we're talking about. So I'd just like to highlight some of that, please, because I think they're often seen as violent and challenging young people, and whilst they may indeed, and are, in fact often are, troubled, troubling and troublesome, this is often for very good cause. So over 60% have been abused. Uh, the NSPCC figures, in fact, are anything from between 33% and 92%, compared to a national average of 16%. 75% of young people who end up in custody have lived with someone other than their parent, um, quite clearly often in the care system. 40% have been homeless before they entered custody. 25% have special educational needs. For boys, 88%, and for girls, 89% have been excluded from school at some point. 60% have significant speech, language, and communication needs. 50% are learning disabled, um, and there is a higher than average number of young people in the secure state with um, high levels of depression, anxiety, and psychotic-like symptoms. And one of the things, I haven't seen statistics for this, but one of the things I have encountered in the youngsters I've spoken to uh, the children young people in the secure state of all types, is the very notable um, numbers of bereavements that, that they have suffered. Large numbers of them have suffered at least one bereavement of a significant person in their, in their life, and numbers of them have suffered more than one bereavement, multiple bereavements of um, primary uh, caretakers or siblings in their, in their household. So there will be more statistics I could add, but I won't. But I just think that that gives us a flavor of the answers we're talking about. Um, we've heard today about how difficult it is, for example, for them to make complaints. Um, so just hearing about the profile, I think, brings home to us that these are children and young people who can't access easily um, written materials. They don't even understand that they have entitlements to things. Indeed, very frequently, they don't believe that they have any rights or any entitlement to anything that is, um, places them in a decent and worthy position because they don't see themselves in that context. As one boy said to me, I was just born bad. There's nothing anybody could have done about it. 
but I have to say, I don't believe that children are born bad. And horrible things happen to some youngsters. They get failed by their parents, they get failed by their communities, they get failed by society, and it is our job to take action to put that right. So we have youngsters with low self-esteem, poor mood, mood regulation, no affect control and self-control, no aspirations and expectations, both uh, for themselves and from what they might get from others. Again, youngsters have said that they expect to be uh, treated badly because that's what happens in life. You just, you do your crime, you do, you, you, you've, you've done a crime, you do your time, and what happens in there just needs to be got through, really. They have no sense that actually um, they should be expecting some kind of treatment, good education, and good care. And of course, these are young people with a very limited repertoire in terms of how they can manage their own behaviors. So again, as we've heard today, sometimes young people may lash out or they may not want to put their shoes on, for example, and this might escalate into something. Um, their, their repertoire for what other mechanisms they might use other than getting cross may be quite difficult, um, uh, limited. And we also see gender differences. So boys tend to get very angry, girls tend to get very distressed, particularly in relation to restraint. And uh, I do always talk to youngsters about restraint when I go into the secure estate. So I would say that with regard to restraint, in my view, the starting point is wrong. The starting point is that there are difficult youngsters who need to be made to conform and comply, rather than an understanding that these are children, young people, very troubled histories who need to be supported um, and assisted in turning their lives around. Um, so what I believe needs to happen is that there should be fundamental reform across the secure estate, um, rather than simply looking at restraint, much as I do welcome um, your inquiry today and the very, very important issues that you've raised. But I think we need to see that, as I, I, I certainly do, within the wider context of how um, support for, for these troubled youngsters is put in place. So what we would like to see is a more humane and welfare-based environment. I've seen some of that. We just have to look at the capital unit, for example, and in sharp contrast to the rest of the site on which it is based. The youngsters I spoke to there, um, none of them uh, had been restrained. Um, and it was quite clear to me that they had very good relationships with the staff. People were on first name terms, um, and, and the interactions were extremely positive. In terms of secure children's home, I would say the very best I've seen, I haven't seen them all, but I've seen a good few, is Swanwick Lodge near Southampton, where again, it's the only place I've been where the, the children could actually talk to me very coherently about the journey that they had, they had made since entering, that they knew that they'd started off with a lot of difficulties and they could talk about um, the help they had received and how they were using that to develop an understanding of themselves, their difficulties in their lives, and, and to, to turn themselves around, and the use they can make of the education, and so on. And again, there weren't youngsters there who described to me that they had been restrained. It doesn't mean that nobody there ever has been, but the ones I spoke to haven't. Uh, we've heard already today about staff-child ratios. I think that's a very, very important issue. I won't say more about that. I think the physical environments are terribly critical in this context. Um, some of these places are not great. Uh, they're very harsh environments, and again, um, put that uh, in contrast to places like the Keppel Unit or Swanwick Lodge, where a great deal of care has gone into those places to make them very humane in, and softer environments. And that, in my experience, makes a significant difference. And then, much as Anne has called for again in a letter to The Guardian this week, there needs to be proper assessment and then support all of these children young people to enable them to turn their lives around. Doing that is good for these children young people and it's good for society. I would add just um, a couple of more things, uh, if I may. One is that, in our view, the deliberate use of pain is wholly unacceptable and there can be no compromise on that. It is not an acceptable position in a civilized society to have state-sanctioned use of pain on children. And indeed, it is not compliant with um, international